All right, everyone. I guess it's 6.30, so we will get started here. If you're in the midst of finding a seat, you can keep doing that, of course. There's a little bit of a hassle to get all this text sorted out, but I've got the screen down to the right height. We've got the projector up. I've got the lighting to be a little bit darker so you can see the screen better. Anyway, all those professors who haven't quite got the tech right, like I sympathize with them now, just considering all the hoops you have to go through. Anyway, um, welcome to the lecture. Thank you all for coming. Um, I got to say, our, our time is valuable. This is something I say every time. Um, and I guess I'm honored that you decided this was something you would spend your time on. Hopefully, this is something that you are able to learn from and benefit from. You're able to help other people, uh, maybe those sitting right beside you. Um, yeah. Uh, first thing to mention, just on a personal note, I'm kind of sick today, actually. Uh, I've got a sore throat, uh, some other stuff going on. So uh, I guess I'm over here and you're over there. We're like more than two meters, so I, I don't think I'll be infecting any of you. But if I lack enthusiasm at some point, it could be because of that. So just putting that out there. OK. Um, let's get going here. Oh boy, okay, it's just like those professors with the bad tech. Okay, there we go. Okay, first slide. I'm Jordan. You already know that. Hooray. I, this is a key point to mention here. I'm not a TA, okay? I am taking the test just as you are. I am in no position of authority over you whatsoever. Um, I've probably studied just as, as much as some of you have. So don't think that I'm some sort of genetics guru or anything like that. Uh, really, I'm just trying to facilitate our collective studying here. Uh, I just happen to like to talk, so that's why I'm, I'm doing this. That's really how this works. Um, that's my Instagram there. Many of you are following it. If you aren't following it, it's valuable to follow. This is where I mention um, when I'm holding lectures. So the post for this lecture was put on there, and any future lectures I hold, which I'm hoping to hold a few more this term, um, will be on there. So something good to follow just if you're looking for updates there. Uh, next thing to mention, okay, um, because this is affiliated with a course, I'm not going to tell you who to vote for, okay, but there are WUSA elections going on. Uh, and I, you might consider this part of your civic duty, you know what I'm saying? So I'm just putting this out there, right? Um, Vote.wusa.ca, that's the place where you can go, or you can just scan the QR code there. If you're a science student, you can vote for WUSA president. WUSA board members, and science faculty center. Those are the uh, things you can vote for. So if you haven't voted yet, I encourage you, vote. You know, get your, get your thoughts out there. All right, so now we're going to get into the, uh, the material here. I want to start off by making this distinction here. A lot of us approach our learning um, by doing just that, learning. We look at a textbook. We uh, kind of memorize what's going on there, think about it a bit, and then just kind of move on. And usually that's fine, but what I want to introduce to you is a deeper level of processing. Uh, I'm also a, a psychology student, so I like to think about that too. I want you to consider discovery, okay? I want you to pretend like there is no textbook, there's no answer key, there's no, um, like there's no right answer. You have to discover that yourself. And it's, it's these experimental procedures which led to the discovery of how genetics works. Mendel, he didn't have the right answers uh, in some sort of textbook somewhere. He came up with them, right? He had to look at experimental evidence and produce consistent theories, okay? I want you to approach our learning like that. I want you to try to originate uh, theories that work with the phenotypic and genotypic ratios that we see. I want you to be able to justify why we have certain ratios that work with certain models of how, I guess, the genes work together. That's sort of thing. I really want you to process this from that angle, from the discovery angle. OK, so we need to start pre-Mendel, though. Okay? And this is what you would observe. These two things are what you would observe without doing any sort of scientific tests. Uh, these two. Uh, types of selection, natural selection and artificial selection, really they're very, very readily observable, okay? Um, so the main idea is like traits are inherited, right? Like if you have a fox, right, like a parental generation of foxes, you're going to get foxes, you know what I'm saying? 
And if they both have white coat color, it's probably going to have offspring that's a white coat color. Not necessarily, but you see what I'm trying to get at here. This is something you can just see if you're just observe um, parents and their progeny, right? And so we, we, we worked with this, and we realized you know, we could do artificial selection, right? Again, this is before Mendel. So what we did, uh, some, some people did, not uh, some, some people, they took Queen Anne's lace, right, which has got a very thin and probably not very edible root, and selectively bred it to make carrots, which we eat on a frequent basis, right? So this is the idea that you can choose certain traits that you like and breed them such that you produce offspring after a bunch of generations that are more desirable, right? So this was going on, like I said, way before Mendel. Uh, dogs are a good example. We'll get right to that. Um, natural selection, you guys will be very familiar with this, okay? This is the idea that the environment selects for useful traits, okay? Traits that enable survival. A great example is the Arctic fox. I didn't just put that up there because it's exceedingly cute, uh, and it is. But <laughs> you can see that it has a white coat color, right? Why does it have a white coat color? It blends in with its surroundings. If that fox was black, right, number one, it wouldn't be able to hunt prey as well, and it might get eaten itself, right? So eventually, those less advantageous traits, they die out of the population. That's why we only see Arctic foxes that have white coats uh, in the Arctic, right? Okay. So those are those two there. Uh, this is kind of an experimental representation of this selective breeding, so artificial selection. We got Belayev's fox experiments. So this is for tameness, okay? So what he did was he took a bunch of wild uh, foxes and he selected the ones that were the most tame. So he just observed the foxes, said these are the ones that are most tame. He bred them together, then from those offspring, selected the ones that were the most tame, bred the ones that were the most tame together, and then just kept doing that, selecting for tameness, until he produced very, very docile foxes. Uh, you know, you can see the contrast there, right? So that's, that's an experimental example of this artificial selection. Um, something we see is called domestication syndrome. Uh, this is something that you can really envision well uh, in dogs, okay? You can see some of the, um, the features here, floppy ears, variations in coat color, shorter muzzle, smaller tooth size, prolonged juvenile behavior, you can think about that in dogs, right? Uh, extended breeding cycle and hormonal changes. Uh, now an interesting thing to consider here, uh, just before we get into Mendel, is that, is the question, like did dogs domesticate themselves or did humans domesticate dogs? That's a very fascinating question. Because um, from one angle you might say, okay, uh, dogs, they can actually get food and resources more easily by just staying around human civilizations than hunting on their own. So maybe they domesticated themselves in order for increased rate of survival. Or you could say from the other angle, uh, dogs have a high degree of utility uh, to humans, right? We can think of all the ways that dogs are very useful. Uh, and they're also just great companions, right? So there's kind of those opposing forces. And there's really no consensus on that. Interesting CBC article here to read if you want to check that out. I'm just throwing that in there. Okay. So we're kind of done with the pre-Mendel and the very obvious things, right? Natural and artificial selection. But now we need to get into the Mendelian genetics. So we'll start off with the basic stuff and just establish the experimental paradigms of Mendel. Okay, so I need you to think about this very briefly. This is just a recall question, okay? What organism did Mendel breed and what were the advantages to breeding this organism compared to others? I want you to give 30 seconds, write down or think about what the answers to those questions are, okay? 30 seconds, go. Right. 
All right. Let's bring it back. Does anyone want to volunteer some answers before I go on to slides that say the answers directly? Any, any thoughts? Yes. That's really good. I think you've hit most, if not all, of them there. What specific organism is it? Oh, uh, the pea plant. The pea plant, that's right. OK. So I'm just going to basically reiterate what you just said. Thank you. They're self-fertile. So if you leave a pea plant, a garden pea, by itself, it will self-fertilize and produce offspring. So theoretically, you could just have one plant, leave it there, and it would just produce offspring without you doing anything. OK? Second, it's easy to cross-fertilize. So what you can do is prevent self-fertilization of the pea plants and then cross-fertilize between desired plants. So you can really easily say, I want to breed this plant with this plant and just quickly do that. It's very simple to do. Um, there's the specific anatomical way that you do that in the slides. It involves a paintbrush and some other things, pollen. You can take a look into that. I'm not going to go through that, but maybe something to know. Um, OK. Large number of offspring. So this is really good for statistical analysis, right? One of the disadvantages to looking at humans is that family sizes are really small, right? So we have to do pedigree analysis instead of large statistical analysis. But with pea plants, we've got a bunch of them, so we can do things like that. Short growing seasons. You can have a bunch of generations right after each other. That makes your experiments uh, happen over a shorter period of time, so just generally quite advantageous that way. Uh, and you can get pure breeding pea plants, so that means that if you take a pure breeding pea plant, uh, breed two ones that are alike together, you will always get the same offspring with the same traits. So every generation, it'll just be the exact same. Uh, the final thing, antagonistic traits, right? Either or traits. So round, wrinkled, yellow, green, um, purple, white flowers. These are things that we can easily say it's this or that. You know, we don't have any co-dominance or incomplete dominance happening here. OK, now I want you to think about this from a kind of a theoretical and experimental perspective. This is the discovery I was talking about earlier. With these resources, with pea plants, and knowing that there's such a thing as artificial selection and natural selection, and if you were curious about how inheritance worked, what would you do if you were Mendel? What is the basic experiment that you would come up with to figure out what's going on with these whole like different trait things, okay? Now, technically, you already have the answer because you know we've gone through the course. But I just want you to think about it. Like, what would you do in order to figure out how certain traits were passed from one generation to the next? Just think about that. Thirty seconds, a minute. What would you do? What experimental procedure would you come up with? OK. Have we thought about this a little bit? OK. All right. Did anyone have any thoughts? What would you do if you were Mendel? Anyone have anything to volunteer? Yes. Yes. So that's the exact experiment that I'm wanting us to come up with. Let's take a look at this from the idea of pure breeding plants, okay? 
we said that we have plants that produce the same offspring when you breed them together, right? They're, they're pure breeding. And so the thought is, what if I took two pure breeding plants that differed in only one trait, right? We had that, that slide with a bunch of different traits. What if I took two pure, pure breeding plants that, say, just differed in flower color, right? What would happen if I bred those two together? See, this is an experiment that takes into account the simplest situation, right? Only one variance, right? Only one trait. And it's also very simple given that it's an antagonistic trait, right? So it's a very simple situation, and hopefully from that simple situation, we can glean some ideas. So we cross two pure breeding plants that differ in only one trait. Now, I've, I've drawn this up here. Hopefully you can see it. You guys already know the result, right? I take, say, say this is flower color, right? Say this is like purple and white, okay? It's not actually purple and white, but whatever. I breed them together, and I get an F1 generation, right? So offspring that are all purple, okay? Now, this is interesting, right? Some might say, wow, only this parent's like, hereditary information was passed on to the offspring, right? Like, what, what if it's just this parent, right? How do we test that theory? Does anyone have any thoughts? How do we test the theory that it's only this parent that contributes its hereditary material. Yes? A reciprocal cross. Not quite what I'm thinking about, but maybe you want to elaborate? Like, okay, I don't know quite how helpful that would be. Um, yeah, good idea. Any other thoughts? Yes? Yes, that, that's what I was thinking of, right? And this is the idea that brings out the, the true character of this F1, right? If this was truly pure breeding, if it was really just the same as that parent, then if we bred uh, a bunch of F1s together, right, or allowed it to self-fertilize, we would just get plants that looked like this, right? But when we perform that experiment, when we allow the F1 to self-fertilize or cross-fertilize within the F1, you get this, right? Three, to four, uh, three out of four and one out of four, right? Whoa, what on earth? What's going on there, right? How do we explain this? What, what, on, what kind of mechanism are we going to use to explain that? So we've crossed the progeny of that cross, right? Here's some explanatory mechanisms, all right? And this is, this is, again, from that perspective of discovery. We all know this, right? But we need to think about why we know this. So first, we need to posit the idea of dominance, OK? And here's why we need to do that. The F1 looks just like one of the parents. There's something, some dominant thing going on, right? This phenotype, we use the term phenotype, right? I've got that at the bottom, genotype and phenotype. So this phenotype, what, what's presenting here, really just looks like this parent. So there's some dominance going on. This somehow is stronger or more apparent than this one. OK, next, we need to posit two alleles, OK? Alleles being units of hereditary information, whatever those are. Remember. Mendel had no idea what chromosomes were or what they had to do with hereditary anything, right? The fact that his theories mapped so well onto chromosomes and physical discoveries that we made is insane, right? But he had no idea. He had no idea at all. So he had these, these hereditary units, and we have to posit two of them, right? If we said there's just one of them, right, then we would see a different ratio, or we would just see that like, we would see that this F1 was pure breeding. We need to posit two. Uh, and so, yes, each gene specifies a trait. OK, and so we have this idea of the gene, right? The gene specifying that one trait. And somehow, we need to have two of them coming together to make this. So, so you see what I'm trying to get at here, right? We need to have two alleles, not one. We need to have a dominant kind of idea going on. And we have the distinction between genotype and phenotype. We have what's being presented and what those two alleles are actually doing, right? Uh, and now I'm just going to quickly draw out the cross that we all are very familiar with, right? So say we have purple, purple, right? We cross this, then we get this, right? And then from there, right, we're going to get one quarter that are homozygous dominant, right? One half that are heterozygous, and one quarter that are homozygous recessive. Classic, right? This is something you should all be very familiar with. 
But the idea is that one of these alleles is dominant over the other, and we see that because it's expressed in the F1, right? And then that's how we can group these together, because the expression here, of course it's going to be expressed when it's homozygous, but when it's heterozygous, we say this one is dominant, this allele is dominant over this allele, therefore our phenotypic ratio is three quarter to one quarter, or three to one, right? So I'm just trying to justify this from an experimental perspective. Okay, some other implications here that are a little bit more theoretical. Um, so this is kind of from a population perspective. You can have polymorphic uh, genes and you can have monomorphic genes, okay? So polymorphic genes, there are several common alleles in the population. Common being defined as greater than 1% expression, okay? That's also the definition of a wild type allele, right? Uh, and then monomorphic, there is one common allele in the population, so only one wild type. Now there can be a bunch of mutant alleles, right? But they would all have less than 1% expression in the population. So just keep that in mind. Okay, second, and this is kind of more of that theoretical perspective. This is one of the laws that Mendel produced from observing this experiment. This is his law of segregation, okay? parental alleles separate through gamete formation. One of the possible two alleles is passed down from each parent, okay? So it's this randomization, right? And that's part of the way that you explain this, is that if there are two units of hereditary information, they're randomly passed down. And from this, there's really no randomness, right? Because we have to posit that this, they're both, they're both homozygous in order for them to be pure breeding, right? Sorry, I made that capital. So, so there's no like randomness there. We can predict what gametes are gonna be passed on. But the idea is that only one of them is passed on. Okay, and then from there, that randomness really helps us to explain why we get these ratios. Okay, so this is the idea of Mendel's law of segregation. So very basic, very core to what we're working with here. Okay, another question for you to think about. What theories of inheritance did Mendel disprove? So what ideas were held before Mendel, and how did he disprove them? What, ex or what features of his experiment did he conduct that really disproved these ideas? Think about that for 30 seconds to a minute. Try to remember what those were. All right, hopefully that's enough time for you to think about this. Does anyone want to volunteer any answers? Yes. Yes, that's right. Yep. Yep, that's absolutely right. Yeah, I think there's one more, that one more idea. Yes. Uh, blended inheritance. The idea that the, uh, the six two parents uh, will be mixed together and the offspring will never be able to be recovered. Mm -hmm. uh, if there's like a completely new form, not be able to be recovered. So if I happen to next generation to be the control of uh, the parental generation, then it's the same thing. Yes. Okay. These are both really good explanations. Um, 
that's really exactly what I have up here. So one parent contributes most to an offspring's inherited features, okay? The idea of a reciprocal cross is that you take, um, say, one parent that has purple flowers, and that's the male parent, right? Then you take the female parent that has white flowers, you breed them together, and you see what offspring they get, right? And of course, you're going to get the ratios that we just discussed, right? The three to one ratio. But then say you switch the roles of the sexes, right? So now the purple flower is the female parent, right? And the white flower is the male parent. And when you cross them, you get the exact same ratio. So this is the idea that being male or female has no implication whatsoever on the proportion that you contribute to the offspring, right? It's exactly one half, right? This plays into Mendel's law of segregation that we have two alleles that one is contributed to the offspring from each parent. Okay, parental traits become mixed and forever change in the offspring. So of course this is disproven by the idea that you get the reappearance of the recessive parental trait in the F2 generation, right? The idea that you're going to get, say again, say white flowers was recessive, you see that trait showing up in F2 and in the parental generation and it skips in the F1. Um, so obviously parental traits don't become mixed and forever changed. Cool, okay. Now we get on to a little bit more complex ideas here. This is the idea of the dihybrid cross. So what if, instead of just taking two pure breeding plants that differed in one trait and crossing them together, how about we get ones that differ in two traits and see what happened there, right? Okay, so let's talk about how this works, okay? Um, what we observe when we cross them, and you can see the Punnett square here. I'm not drawing Punnett squares because they're kind of annoying to draw and branch line diagrams are better. But I just want you to see here how that works. Maybe it's better for visualization with this dihybrid cross. But the classic ratio you're gonna see with this nine to three to three to one. And what I wanna do is just explain how we arrive at that, okay? I'm just gonna go through the branch line diagram, then we're gonna go through the formal uh, mechanisms that really explain this, okay? So what we can see here, I've just written up some letters to show you this, but we've got dihybrids, right? Di meaning two traits, hybrids meaning that we've got heterozygous um, genes, right, or, or two alleles that are different. Okay, so you see we're just crossing two, um, two hybrids here, so nothing crazy going on. And what I want you to see is that we can use the law of multiplication. I think that's what's called, multiplicative law. Um, and the idea is that we can just assess one allele at a time, right? So if we think about the phenotypic ratio just for this first allele, or first gene, these, these P alleles right here, okay? What is the probability that we get the dominant phenotype? Three quarters, right? That all makes sense? We just discussed that in the previous example, right? Okay, three quarters for the dominant here. Okay, and then of course one quarter for the recessive phenotype. Great. Then I can just take the second, um, the second gene and put the probabilities at each of these. So I can say within this uh, like precursor probability, you can say, this three quarters that are gonna be the dominant phenotype for this P gene, uh, what's the probability that we also get dominant for the W? Another three quarters, right? What's the prob probability that we get the recessive one? One quarter, right? And the same goes for this situation as well. So this, is where you end up getting the ratio, right? You multiply these together, in the end you get nine out of 16, you get three out of 16, another three out of 16, and then a one out of 16. So you can see that's a nine to three to three to one ratio. That's how we justify it, okay? And so I just wanna formalize that by saying that we have the law of independent assortment. This is the exact mechanism that we use to be able to do this branch line diagram. The fact that we can assess genes independently. What happens on one gene has no effect until later on. We discuss this some weeks later, right? But it has no effect on what happens at the other gene. So I can just assess the probabilities for this P gene independent of the probabilities for this W gene. And that makes me that enables me to draw this branch line diagram, okay? 
Uh, we also have the law of product. This is what I just discussed, but formally, the probability of two or more ind independent events occurring together, you just multiply their probabilities together, right? So that's what we're just doing here. And the law of sum, so that doesn't directly apply to this, but it's still very good to know. You'll have to use it in practice problems. Uh, the probability uh, of one of multiple mutually exclusive events occurring is the sum of their individual probabilities. This is the idea, uh, I, I, it's really good to illustrate with a dice, right? If you roll a dice, it's only going to land on one side, right? But if I ask you, what's the probability of it landing on one, two, or three, right? What you would do is you'd say, well, there's a one-sixth probability of it landing on one, one-sixth of it landing on two, and one-sixth of it landing on three. So I just add all of those together, and I get a one-half. That's really just the idea of the law of sum. Okay, so with the idea of the uh, monohybrid cross and the dihybrid cross. Now we just also have to consider the test cross, which is this idea of how can we figure out what the true genotype of a dominant expressing um, phenotype, phenotypic organism really is, right? Is the genotype homozygous dominant or is it heterozygous? And how do we know, right? So the answer is that we just cross this mystery um, organism with an organism that is recessive at that gene, right? So what I would do then, just for a single gene, right? The idea is I would take, we're going to say for W, right? So I, I, I illustrate it like this, right? I have my dominant allele, I have my blank, this could be dominant or recessive, and I cross it with one that is recessive, homozygous recessive, right? And so from there, we can just figure out what the, what the offspring will be. So if, I, if, I, if this is truly homozygous dominant, all of my offspring are going to look like the dominant phenotype, all of them, okay? And it's just the simple idea of probabilities, right? This has to contribute a gamete that's dominant. This has to contribute a gamete that is recessive. So all of the offspring are going to look like this, right? But if our mystery organism is like this, half of the offspring will have the recessive phenotype and the other half will have the dominant phenotype. And so that's how we can really be sure what this mystery um, genotype is. That's the basic idea behind a test cross. And you can do this not just with like a single gene, of course, but really as many as you wanted to, right? Where there's a mystery of, you know, is this homozygous dominant or is this heterozygous? Okay, now we're going to move on from these simpler ideas to more complex ideas. So, some genes have multiple alleles. Wow, okay. We already talked about the idea of wild type and mutant, right? Wild type, again, there's the notation for it, right? That superscript plus, uh, is greater than 1% allele frequency in the population. That's how you know it's wild type. Anything less than that is called a mutant. And so, what we can do with these multiple alleles. So not just two of them, right? The examples we've just had have been like, hooray, we have dominant and this recessive one, done, right? What if we had three or four in the population? How do we figure out the dominance relationship there, right? Well, we make a dominance series. And that looks something like this, okay? You do some, you do some crosses between the various uh, pure breeding uh, representatives of these different genotypes, and you figure out what the offspring are, right? And this is the idea of taking your homozygous parents, you make a heterozygous offspring, you figure out which one is dominant, just like we did in that classic monohybrid cross. Look at the F1, figure out what the F1 are, right? So that's what we're doing here. Uh, and you, I mean, I don't really have to go through this, but you can see that this wild type one here is dominant, right? It's producing all the offspring there. And then when I take the ones that are not the wild type and I breed them together, I see the Himalayan is dominant over the albino, so then I can rank them wild type Himalayan albino. That's how I can do that. Does it make sense? Cool, dominant series. All right, uh, another basic idea here, co-dominance, okay? What if we don't have antagonistic traits? What if there is mixing of the traits in the phenotype? Hmm, what would that look like, right? Example number one, co-dominance. So what you can have are contributions 
from both alleles that are visible in the phenotype, okay? Um, so it's not just the dominant one that's contributing to the phenotype, it's both of them. Now, in what proportion, that comes into question. In this picture, it's fairly equal, right? You kind of see a fairly equal production of white and pinkish red there, okay? And what's, what's really interesting is the phenotype displays the genotype. So I can look at that phenotype and tell you exactly what the genotype is. That, that really comes in handy, right? Um, I can tell you that I know that that's heterozygous, right? Uh, and if it was just white or just pink, I could say, okay, you know, it's homozygous for the white or the, the pink allele. Uh, and of course, our ratio here is a one to two to one. So what we're, what we're not doing is combining the homozygous dominant with all of our heterozygotes, right? That brings us our three quarters. We're separating those because the homozygous dominant and the heterozygous genotypes, they produce different phenotypes. So instead of the three to one, we now have the one to two to one. Okay, incomplete dominance. So this is the same, same ratio, right? And the, the same idea that we have not a complete dominance happening, right? But instead of seeing both, like two, two different characteristics, we see an intermediate characteristic between the recessive phenotype and the dominant phenotype. Um, and again, I can look at the phenotype and tell you the genotype. There is no mystery in looking at that phenotype as to what genotype there is. There is no need for a test cross in either co-dominance or incomplete dominance. All right, so now what I want you to think about, this gets a little bit to that deeper level of understanding. If you're a scientist, which hopefully all of us will be someday, right? What would you posit as the underlying mechanisms behind incomplete dominance and co-dominance? And again, like I'll just give you a little bit of brief background here. Hopefully all of us know this though. We're talking about protein production, right? DNA codes for proteins eventually, right? That whole central dogma idea, right? So what can be going on with the proteins here? What can be going on with products in the, in the organism? So think about that for 30 seconds and we'll get someone to give an answer. Let's bring it back. Does anyone have any thoughts? What's going on with the underlying mechanisms? Any thoughts at all? Yes. Okay, I would say that's a better explanation for codominance, um, and I'll explain why here. So the idea with codominance, and I'll just flip back to that slide here, is you can see that both colors are being produced, right? So if there's one protein that works, that displays, that kind of in somehow leads to the expression of the white color, right? 
then that is present and that's doing its thing, right? And then the same, pro and then the other protein that codes for that, that pinkish red color, right, uh, is also doing its thing. So it's like you have two different proteins that are working at the same time. And it's just a matter of where they get express, expressed on the plant, right? So two proteins almost in competition, right? They're both dominant and they're, they're this co-dominance idea, right? But two proteins, they're competing. For incomplete dominance, you can think of this as a matter of dosage, right? If homozygous dominant is two doses of the protein that's producing red, right? Then what if you only got one dose, right? That's a way of thinking about it. That there's not enough proteins to fully express the red color. So you get this intermediate phenotype that's, that was somewhat able to express the full color, but not completely. So it's like a half dose instead of a full dose. See what we're getting there, that idea? Okay, cool. Next question. Name these degrees of expression. I'll give you 30 seconds to think about it, and then I want an answer from someone. Think about it. All right, let's bring it back. Okay, does anyone have a firm answer for what all of those are? If you can't do all of them, just do some of them. If you get it wrong, that's completely fine. Come on, guys, there's got to be someone. Yes. Okay, I'm not looking for the term dominance. Yes, it's like a, maybe, okay, so I'm just gonna say expressivity, right? Like constant expression. Okay, solid, yes, good. Um, anything else? Yes. Not what I'm looking for, good try. And I'm glad you put your hand up. Anyone else? Yes. The middle ones have variable expression. Yes, variable expression. I'm going to say the top one is variable expression. It's, it's hard to see. These two positions have nothing there. That one and that one. Okay, there's nothing there. So this variable expression applies to the top middle one. Anyone else for what the other ones are? Yes. Yep. Yes. Yes, that's, yeah, ex that's exactly right. So you can see that right here. We've got constant expression on the right, or on the left, variable expression, top middle, incomplete penetrance on the right, and then incomplete penetrance because we have nothing here and nothing here, so the trade is not coming through at all. And then you've got that mixed with variable expression because we have different degrees of the phenotype being expressed. Hopefully that all makes sense. Uh, if that's something you didn't remember, then just study it. You're good, we got time. All right, next topic to bring up, pleiotrophy, okay? This is the idea that one gene influences multiple traits or multiple phenotypic expressions in the offspring, okay? And the classic example is sickle cell anemia, right? Uh, we should all be very, familiar with this disease, going back to whenever you took biology in grade 11, definitely when you took it in grade 12, right? And this is the idea that a single point mutation 
in the gene, so you can see that on the left here, point mutation here, going from glutamine to valine causes a defect in the two beta globins right here and there. Okay? So you get from the, the, the regular ones you can see that are blue up there, and you get to these ones that are defective. And essentially what occurs then is the sickling of the red blood cells. What does this cause? Multiple health problems, and you could say these are phenotypic expressions, right? Uh, so obviously sickled blood cells, uh, but you've got anemia, circulatory blockages, kidney failure, heart failure, and a bunch of other things, okay? So you can see that those are multiple phenotypic um, traits, right? Multiple traits that we see. Uh, and so a classic example, a pleiotrophy. Now we get to lethal alleles. Okay, so here we are talking about lethality. Um, and this is the idea that the expression of a certain genotype is such that it kills the organism. So, you know, not flower color or even, you know, circulatory problems. We're just saying, like, it just outright kills the organism. Okay, so you can have the, the genotype that causes this lethality. Uh, you can have it as recessive or dominant, okay? Um, I'm going to wager that the recessive is more common. And you can think about why. I encourage you to think about that. But you can see this on the left here. Um, you can see in the Punnett square that it's recessive for lethality, right? One quarter, which is kind of the definition of a recessive ratio for a classic two allele gene, um, you know, it, it's, it's lethal there, but not here and here. Now, the agouti gene in mice, not rats, mice, uh, also codes for coat color, right? So this agouti gene is dominant for its yellow coat color. So you would think that, you know, three to one, right? That's what you would think. But since it's also recessive for lethality, it kills that homozygous dominant genotype uh, for the organism. So instead of getting a three to one ratio, you get a two to one ratio. You can see how that makes sense, right? Uh, this is also a classic example of pleiotrophy, right? One gene is affecting two traits, coat color and lethality. So two effects of one gene. So that's what you should be seeing. You can kind of keep that in your mind. Recessive lethality, two to one ratio. And that missing one right here is because uh, the organism died, that homozygous dominant organism died. Okay, now here's a question for you. What happens if an allele is dominant for lethality? There are two cases that you can think about. I'm not going to tell you what those are, but I just want you to think about it. Like, what would happen in a population? Just think about, like, allele frequency in a population. Um, if, if, if a gene was, if an allele was dominant for lethality. Think about that. 30 seconds. What's going on? All right. That's fairly sufficient time to think about this. Does anyone have thoughts that they want to put forward? What would happen if an allele was dominant for lethality? Yes. Yeah, that's a really good way of putting it. That's right. And that would be the case if, if 
the onset of the lethality was quite soon, right? So either in utero or very soon after birth, right? So basically the organism would die before it has the chance to reproduce. That would mean that the allele would just fall out of the population. Like there's no way that it would be um, like passed on to any progeny, right? There's, there's just no way that that happens. However, however, and this is the uh, case with Huntington's, um, you can have it such that it is passed on because the onset of lethality happens later in life, right? So you have the opportunity to pass it on before, maybe even you discover that you have Huntington's. Okay, good to keep in mind there. On the subject of lethality, name the two possible environments for conditional lethality. Okay, so there are some um, cases of lethality where depending on the environment, right, or the situation that the organism finds itself in, classic example is sickle cell anemia with altitude, right? Um, what are those two conditions? I, I, I won't actually break for this. Does someone know at all? Yes. Yes, that's exactly what we're looking for. Permissive, it lives. So for sickle cell anemia, that would be at low altitudes. If you go to high altitudes, you're into a restrictive condition. You die or things get worse. It's specifically regarding lethality, you would die in a restrictive condition. Okay, cool. That was another thing we covered, just to remember. Now we get to additive genes. So two genes affecting one trait. It's going to be fascinating to look at. We get into some complex stuff going on here. First, epistasis. Da -da -da -da. I would say if there's like one thing that's the most interesting to look at in this first test, it's epistasis. So this is the idea that two genes involved in, really important to remember, separate biological pathways contribute to the expression of one trait with one gene masking the effects of the other. So if you are the masking gene, you are the epistatic gene. You are epistatic to the other gene. And if you're that other gene that is being masked, you are hypostatic, okay? The hypostatic gene and the epistatic gene. Okay, first one we're gonna cover is dominant epistasis, okay? So what I want you to think about, let's look at this this example here, okay? We have C's and G's, okay? The C gene is the epistatic gene, okay? And it's epistatic when it has the dominant phenotype, okay? So it's either homozygous dominant or heterozygous thus dominant, right? And so what we can do is use Mendel's law of independent assortment to work this out with another simple branch line diagram, right? I know I have the Punnett square right there, but it's very simple to work out why we see this ratio, right? And the ratio being 12 to 3 to 1. Now, this doesn't really show up very well here, but that's green and that's yellow. Okay, they're not 4, 12 to 3 to 1. Okay, so let's justify. Why do we have 12, uh, 12 masked phenotypes, right, that are white? There's no expression there, right? Let's think about this. What's the probability for the first gene, for the C gene, that it expresses its dominant phenotype? Well, if we were to do a classic hybrid cross, right, which you can see here, that's exactly what we're doing, right? We're, heter we're heterozygous on both of those genes for the cross that we're doing. So if we think about this, right, the, the dominant phenotype has a three quarters chance of being expressed, right? And if it is expressed just by default, the other gene is not expressed. So we don't need to multiply this by anything else. Like we don't need to do that. Because if we have our dominant phenotype on the epistatic gene, we have no expression, just straight period, right? So if we have 16 boxes, right? So we can just multiply this by essentially one or four over four, right? And that's how we get our 12 out of 16. And then if we say within the recessive case, the recessive case for this C gene, right, the epistatic gene, within that, what is the probability that we get either yellow or green, right? Yellow being the dominant phenotype, green being the recessive one. Again, classic three to one ratio, right? So we can just say three quarters 
to one quarter. And again, expressing this within the whole probability of 16 squares, because again, we are looking at two genes. Again, you multiply that by 4 over 4, right? And you get 12 to 3 to 1. That explanation makes sense. We're using this rule of multiplication, Mendel's law of independent assortment, being able to look at individual genes, and we're coming up with this Punnett square. OK, so that's dominant epistasis. Let's look at recessive epistasis, OK? So this is the case where the masking gene, the epistatic gene, uh, does the masking when it's recessive, OK? So one quarter of the time instead of three quarters of the time. And you can see that here, right? So this is the E gene. It, that's the epistatic gene. You can see that right here. One, two, three, four. Four out of 16, that's one quarter. So one quarter of the time it's doing the masking. Great. Again, I'm just going to go through the multiplication here to get us this 9 to 3 to 4 ratio to show us why it makes sense, OK? So one quarter of the time, it's being masked. OK, great. So that is 4 out of 16, just straight up, right? 4 out of 16, 1 quarter, multiplied by 4 over 4. Great. OK, within the squares that remain, there are 12 squares that remain, right? What is the probability that we get the dominant phenotype? Again, with classic dominance relationships, Three quarters of the time, right? Three quarters of those 12 squares are going to have the dominant phenotype. So we take three quarters, multiply by 12, and we get nine, okay? And within those 12 squares, again, what's the probability that we get the recessive phenotype? One quarter of the time. Again, classic monohybrid cross. Multiply your, um, your 12 squares by one quarter, and you get three. So that's why we get our nine to three to four ratio. This is the epistatic contribution. This 3 to 1 ratio is the contribution of a classic monohybrid cross. You see how that makes sense? Again, it's really taking advantage of this idea of the law of independent assortment and using our ability to just multiply probabilities. Okay, so again, like what we should be able to do is if we have a question thrown at us that says, we observe this ratio. You know the mechanism that's happening right away. You don't have to think about it. Boom, recessive epistasis, right? It's just, you don't really have to think about it at all. OK, let's look at an example of recessive epistasis. This is ABO blood types. This is the one example that we're, we really have to be very familiar with uh, for the test. We're probably going to get thrown an ABO blood type question. Uh, again, I'm not in any position to definitively tell you that, but I've heard this from our professor, so, you know, good to be able to, to cover. Okay, so we understand that this is a case of codominance, right? You can either have, uh, on the top right here, so you can have like an A type, right, which is either uh, homozygous dominant or heterozygous. You can have the B type, again, homozygous dominant or heterozygous, or you can have A, B type, right? which is an expression of both the A and the B. Uh, or you can have type O, OK? And this is where we bring in, um, oh, that, that's just the recessive, right? So there's kind of four cases instead of three, OK? Very simple there. All right, OK. And th that's, that's shown in these pictures here, right? All of this. So what this is coding for, gene one, right? And we're assessing gene one right now. There's, there's two genes involved with this. Um, but we can see here, it's just coding for the sugars, right? So you can have just the A sugars, you can have just the B sugars, you can have the A and the B sugars, or you can have none of the above, okay? And so what's interesting to assess here is this is, this is three possible alleles, right? We have that, um, like the, the A allele, right, the B allele, or the recessive one, which is like the non-expressing one, OK? But we also need to consider a second gene, because it's not just three alleles with some codominance happening. We also have the recessive epistasis, the epistatic nature of ABO blood types, OK? And this is called the Bombay allele, OK? And we represent it with an H. So in the system that I just showed on the previous slide, I'll just hop back there for a sec, we see how we have these sugars uh, on the outside of the red blood cell, right? What we also have are these lipids here, 
that the, that the sugars are bound to, right? And what we're showing here is that if we don't have any of the lipids at all, then we can't have any sugars binding, right? And so this is where, this is the unactual mechanism of how the epistasis is occurring. So the epistasis occurs because it's recessive, right? It only occurs when we have homozygous recessive at this H gene. So it occurs one quarter of the time if we were to do the whole analysis thing, right? But um, in the case that we have homozygous recessive, those lipids are gone. So regardless of what your genotype is on the first gene, whether it's A, B, AB, or O, right, the expressed phenotype is just going to be O. Because there's, there's no, uh, like the proteins, the sugars, can't bind at all to those lipids because there's no lipids there, right? So the idea is that we have no phenotype expressed because there's no mechanism for it to be expressed. And remember earlier when I said there are two different biological pathways that make this occur in epistasis, right? We can see those two different biological pathways. The first one is the sugar, right? We're adding the sugar. The second pathway is making the lipid, okay? And those work together to create the epistasis. Hopefully that makes sense. Any questions? Are we good? Solid. Okay. Here's a question to reflect on. That should be a very simple yes or no question. So I'm just going to ask someone to give an answer. Can ABO blood types be used with complete certainty, without making any assumptions, for paternity testing? Yes or no? Yes. No. That's right. Sorry, I just said yes. I don't, I don't mean to conflict. It's a definite no. Why is it a definite no? Yes. Where you're mentioning recessive here, that could just be interpreted what you're saying within the context of gene one. Like I also, I need some kind of reference to epistasis here. Yes. Okay. Uh, what I'm trying to get at here is the idea that you can have one parent express the O phenotype, right? but they can actually have a different genotype on gene one, right? Like they could have, uh, say, AB blood, right? But because on that H gene, right, that epistatic gene, they have um, homozygous recessive, then they express an O blood type, right? But if the other parent is homozygous dominant on that H gene, then the offspring is going to be able to uh, kind of escape the Bombay situation, right? Like they aren't going to be epistatic, right? And then you can get a different phenotype in the offspring. So the idea is that with this chance of epistasis, you really have no way to predict what the parent is. Like you, you have no way to logic back because of this option that, well, you know, maybe they're epistatic, so we really, we really can't tell what that gene one is. Like, we really have no way of knowing for certain, okay? Uh, and again, I would encourage you to take a look at, you know, the associated Punnett squares or really try to think about this yourself. But there's a lot, there's some uncertainty there. If we assume, if we, if we assume that there's no Bombay gene, right, that epistatic gene uh, occurring at all, like if we just eliminate that from our analysis, then we can use this for paternity testing. We can logic back. But if we consider the epistatic gene, the Bombay gene, then our whole analysis is thrown off. OK, next type of like two genes affecting one trait, complementary gene action. This is also known as reciprocal recessive epistasis. So this is two or more genes working in tandem in the same biochemical pathway, the same pathway, to produce a particular trait. And the key idea with this is a heterogeneous trait. So a mutation in one of multiple genes can produce the same trait, okay? 
Uh, and a really good way of just envisioning what that just said is the idea of a pathway. Look at this bottom section right here, okay? In order to produce the desired trait, which would be a purple flower color, you can see that up there, we have to have two alleles being active, right, or doing their thing. You've got to color this precursor. The action of allele A catalyzes a reaction, right, and it gets you to this colorless precursor. From there, with the action of allele B, you finally get to the purple pigment. If you lack the action of allele A, you don't get the purple pigment. If you lack the action of, uh, of allele B, you also don't get the purple pigment. And if you lack both, you certainly don't get the purple pigment. So the idea here is that we need both genes working together to produce the purple pigment. They're working in the same biochemical pathway. It's not the idea of, you know, like a lipid stock and a sugar. They're both working to produce the same thing. And this is where we can come up with the Punnett square that's on the left here, right? Um, and the situation is that we need the dominant phenotype in both of them in order to uh, express this final purple pigment. So what we can do is, again, use our rule of multiplication, right, to simply figure this out. What is the probability when assessing one gene that we get the dominant phenotype in a classic dominance relationship? Someone just shout it out. The probability that I get the dominant phenotype in a classic monohybrid cross. Three out of four, that's right, three quarters. Okay, great. All right. What's the probability that I get a dominant phenotype for this second? Allele. Yes. Three quarters. That's right. Hooray. Okay. Now, these are two independent events, right? So, what do I do to find the probability of both of them happening? I multiply them together, right? What does this equal? 9 out of 16. If you look on the Punnett square, you will see nine purple squares, right? And then everything else is going to be recessive at either one gene or both genes, okay? You can see that in all the white squares. It's either uh, homozygous recessive for A, homozygous recessive for B, or homozygous recessive for both genes. So that's where we come up with the nine to seven. You can see like whatever's left over, right? Like how many more do I have to add to get to 16? I have to add seven, right? So that's where I get the final nine to seven, all right? So whenever you see nine to seven, you should immediately think complementary gene action. And then you can, exp you can then reason from there, we have one, bio one biological pathway, right, instead of two working in tandem. Let's look at complementation testing. So how do we test if complementation is occurring? Well, we can do this, this kind of cross here, right? So say we look at the case of deafness, right? And we, we posit the idea that maybe it's two genes that are working together to produce deafness, right? What if that's the case? So we take two parents that are both deaf, right? And if we cross them together and find that their offspring can hear, then we, that supports the conclusion of complementation. Why? Because we can, we can see that the parents are homozygous recessive at one of the genes, right? They're homozygous recessive at B or A, but the offspring is a hybrid, right? So it expresses the dominant phenotype uh, in both genes. And so the complementation there allows the offspring to hear, right? Now, the second case, which is where the parents are both homozygous recessive on the same gene, gene B, does not support the conclusion of complementation. It may still be occurring, right? Like, there's no complementation happening, but it, there's still maybe two genes that affect hearing. There's just no evidence to support that, right? Because we just have deaf and deaf in both generations. Um, let's take a look at this from, like, the physical gene perspective, right? So you can see here, uh, this is when complementation is occurring. You can see at gene one, the first parent uh, has got homozygous recessive. And at gene two, the parents here, that parent on the right, has got homozygous recessive. When you breed them together, 
what you're able to get is the hybrid, right? And so then the dominant phenotype is expressed for both genes. And so then you get the wild type or the normal, the non-recessive phenotype. So the genes are working together to produce, they're complementing each other to produce the wild type phenotype. In the case that complementation is not occurring, you would see, um, you would see a recessive, homozygous recessive for, for gene two, so just for one gene in both parents. So in the same gene, they would be homozygous recessive. And so then obviously the offspring would also have to be homozygous recessive. You can see that there's not two genes working together here. It's just the classic case of like just a simple one of these, like AA, AA produces AA. Like that's all we can go off of, right? We just have homozygous recessive, homozygous recessive, okay? There still may be two genes working, right? But we have no evidence for that. We have no evidence for that. We would need to have uh, the, same, the same condition. So if we go back to like deafness, right? We would need to have this first case to happen as well. So if we, if we ran the second case and all of the, all of the people who are ever deaf, if, if you had a cross between two parents that were both deaf, and all the time the children were deaf, we would have evidence for stating that, the, that this is non-complementation, that there's never a complementation that happens. It's just there's never two genes that work on this. But if some of the time the offspring could hear and some of the time they couldn't hear, then it's fairly safe to say that there are two genes working. Just sometimes there's complementation happening and sometimes there isn't, right? So it's kind of this idea of balancing there being two genes and balancing complementation happening or not happening. Okay, fairly complex idea, but we got that done here. Okay. Now, uh, here is another idea. Uh, this is something that was, ha was covered like later in lecture two. Um, just like quick note again, I'm not covering absolutely everything that was covered in the lectures. Uh, all those little details are some of the edge cases. So, you know, make sure you do your own studying, of course. This is not a substitute for your own studying. But this was one of the other major things that was discussed. You can see the ratio here, the phenotypic ratio is nine to three to three to one. But in this case, okay, we're only looking at one trait, at one trait. Two genes are determining one trait, not in an epistatic manner, but they, they both contribute to the trait. So it's not like you have two, two potential traits. There's four potential traits in a ratio of nine to three to three to one. So it's the same rules of multiplication that get us to that ratio, right? But in, instead of affecting, um, like instead of working in an epistatic manner, it, it just affects one trait. Um, I don't know how much more I can say on this, but you, you can see the Punnett square right there, right? And this example specifically, I think, has to do with, with chickens and their combs, right? Um, but it affects one trait, but it's two genes working together in the same manner as what you would see in a classic dihybrid cross that we covered earlier. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, I'm seeing that it's 744, so what I want to do is give us a brief break here. I'm thinking like five minutes just to get up, walk around a little bit, whatever. Uh, and then we're going to come back. I just have like a couple more slides and then just a few practice problems, okay? Practice problems that are similar to what you would see on the test. Then we'll be done, okay? So we're going to go five minute break and then we'll take it up after that. No, it hasn't closed yet. Thanks for coming, guys. Yeah, thank you. Yeah.
question. Yeah. Are you doing the binomial theorem in this? Like yes. Okay. Yep. Yep. I hope you win. Okay, thanks. Uh, I would say less than 30 minutes. Yep. That's nice. About what? Yeah. Um. Yep. Genuine question. Mm -hmm. Um. So, how the f are, are these like scripted, or do you just like talk? Like, is it just kind of winging it? Because I'm so fascinated by the fact that you can just talk to like a room of like 200 people for like an hour, two hours straight. Yeah, I just wing it. <laughs> Seriously? Like, I, I make a slideshow. I try to understand what I'm talking about, and then I just do it. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. I don't know. I just find it pretty fun to do. Kind of comes naturally. Yeah. yeah. I mean, how often do you like study every day? Because crazy often. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, because just when I look at this, I'm like, wow, it just probably takes so much time. Like, I'm, I'm in awe. Like, I could never do this. I'm amazed you could do this. Thank you so much. Yeah. You know, I just wanted to ask if you do a script or talk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think like with more practice, like initially when I first started doing public speaking, I would definitely. Oh, I guess you, well, you, have you been doing public speaking your whole life? For a while, yeah, yeah. But then after a while, you just kind of get to a point. Yeah. Yeah, they usually have to do this. And it helps you with the slides. Yeah, it helps me. Are you going to post the slideshows that you, or like... You want me to? Yeah. Do you have a physics in the terminal where I'm looking at later today? Okay, okay. Uh, I can post my Instagram. Yeah, just like a link or something. Yeah, do you guys follow the Instagram? Yeah, like, yeah. Okay. Okay, I can post it there. I'm, I'm also doing the recording, so hopefully that works. Okay. And I can post it there. Thanks so much. Okay, thank sure. you so much. Okay. Um, like 15, 20 minutes, something like that. Yeah. All right, everyone. We'll bring it back now. Uh, I just have one reflection question and then four practice questions that are similar to what we would see on the test. And that will wrap things up. Uh, I do have to address the elephant in the room here. I guarantee you this is the first time any of you have seen me in a t-shirt. Um, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I, I, I guess I just did it to make it worth the price of admission, which, just to clarify, is nothing. But 
uh, savor this last 20 minutes, because this is the last time you'll see this in quite a while. So, <laughs> okay. Um, so here's the question. Discuss the differences between sex-linked, sex-limited, and sex-influenced traits. What do each of those mean? Talk about that with those around you. Give you 30 seconds to a minute. Okay, do we have any answers? Someone involved? Yes. You pretty much just hit the nail on the head. Um, yeah, I would just add to that that sex linked, of course, occurs on the X or Y chromosomes. Sex limited and sex influenced are autosomal, right? So they, they are never on the X or Y chromosome, at least to my understanding. I, I wouldn't take that as 100%, but they are autosomal. That's, that's what I've seen in slideshows. Okay. Now we're going to do a practice problem here. This is the binomial expansion question. We're going to go over how that works, right? But I want you to just compute this. If you've got a calculator or you've got a phone, do this. I literally made up this question a few hours before uh, this lecture. So just do it quick. Uh, you also have to, of course, draw out Pascal's triangle. Uh, so do that as well. If you don't know the rule, learn it or see my solution. Four times that. Um, I'm not thinking the coefficient is four. Does anyone else have a coefficient of four? No. Okay. Let's give it. Yes. Okay. Uh, the the coefficient I had was 15, but let's run that. Okay. Um, I'm just gonna like and again correct me if I'm wrong here, but I'm just gonna draw Pascal's triangle quick. Okay. Um, one, 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 okay, one, two, one, one, three, three, one, okay, this is our level zero, this is our level one. I may have read this as being level one, so I'm not sure my coefficient's exactly right. We'll see now. This is level two, this is level three, okay, one, four, six, four, one. See, I'm constructing this, right? Above a number, I take the two that are directly above it, right? Everything on the edge is a one, right? And it's, these are like labels for n, so I'll, I'll put them over here. Like, zero, one, two, three, four. Okay, and then one, five, add those together, 10, 10, five, one, okay, great. Put that there. Six, 15, 20, 15, 
six, one. Okay? Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. N equals six. Okay, so when we're doing a binomial expansion, the idea is P plus Q to the N, okay? So for a binomial expansion question, the idea is that we have two possibilities, okay? And one of those two possibilities will always be the case, okay? You can never have not P or not Q occurring. It's either or, okay? And there is a, a probability associated with P and Q. In the case of children, right, male or female, it is one half for each of them, right? A half probability that this will be a male and a half probability that it will be a female offspring, okay? So P and Q are both equal to one half. You can see that actually right up there, okay? N equals six refers to the fact that there are six offspring, yes? Four and Makes sense? Okay, cool. All right. So with that information, we need to work with this expansion. So the idea here is that we, when we add both probabilities together, right, and we put it to the number of times that we run these unrelated events, right, like the fact that the previous offspring was, say, a boy or a girl does not affect whether a future offspring will be a boy or a girl, right? That's the idea. Um, when we do that, that tells us kind of the overall probability, right? Like, technically, if I did this, right, the probability of getting a boy and a girl, add those together, that would be one, right? You're either going to get a boy or a girl. Put that together, as one. And then to the end, it would be six. So it's kind of like saying the total probability that I get a boy or a girl each time is one. Like, 100% of the time, you're either going to get a boy or a girl. That's essentially what this is saying. But when I expand it out, I am able to look at the probabilities for specific combinations of boys and girls, right? So the idea here is that I would be able to say like P to the 6, P to the 5, Q to the 1, P to the 4, Q to the 2, P to the 3, Q to the 3, right? And then I would continue that down to Q to the 6, okay? That's the idea. Now, you may be wondering, why do we associate coefficients with this at all, right? Why do we have to put coefficients here? Other than the mathematical fact that there are coefficients for each of these when you expand something, like that's just how it is, right? How you can consider this genetically, and it's easier to look at this from a smaller scale, right? Like, say we had uh, three offspring, right? Um, male and female, right? Uh, you can, and, and say the case is that we have two boys and one girl, right? You can either have a birth order of boy, boy, girl. You could have boy, girl, boy, or girl, boy, boy. There are three different ways of achieving this, right? So what do we see for an n equals 3? That's an n equals 3 situation, right? We look down here, 2 to 1, 3, right? As a coefficient of 3, three different ways of this occurring. So that, that's kind of what we're, what we're referring to when we have the coefficient. It's the ways in which we could get that ratio. So the way we work this out is we say n equals 6, and we have four boys, two girls. Okay, so we look at this then, and we say we go down to n equals 6, and we say p equals 6, q equals 0. That's not the one we want. Then we have p, equal, p to the 5 and q to the, six, uh, q to the 1, right? Five and then to the one. That's also not what we want. P to the four, Q to the two. That's what we want, right? We have equal probabilities, so one half, right? To the four, and then one that's one half to the two. Four boys, two girls. Does that make sense? Do we get why I'm selecting this coefficient? We chill with that? Okay. All right. So we take 15, and then we just multiply it by P and Q to their respective powers, which is this. And of course, they're both going to be one half, so it's essentially one half to the sixth multiplied by 15. And you get that ratio. Does that make sense? Cool. Anyone need me to go over anything again? Are we good with that? All right, I'm going to take that as a yes. Question two Assuming no involvement of the Bombay phenotype, if a girl has blood type B, and her mother has blood type A, what are the possible genotypes and phenotypes of the father, 
So this is paternity testing, assuming no effect of the, of the Bombay phenotype. What must the mother's genotype be as well? Think about that, and we'll come back with an answer. Feel free to write things down. Problems are better solved when you write stuff down. All right. Is that enough time? I, I guess this is the type of question we'd see on a test, so it, it, I guess it better be <laughs> enough time. All right. Does someone want to volunteer a solution to this? Yes. Okay. Okay, so most of what you said is true, some of it not quite. The, yes? No, well, I would say if the mother was like a um, child, yep. that's all it would be. Yes, yes, that's right. That's the other case we can consider. Uh, I'm just going to flip to the solution here. So the father's potential genotypes. Uh, he's got to have something with a B in it, right? If the offspring has a B in it, and the mother is expressing only A, then the father's got to have some sort of B in there, right? So he could be homozygous dominant for B. That could for sure be the case. He could be heterozygous for B with the recessive allele there. Or he could be type AB, right? And it could just be the 50% probability that the offspring gets the type B allele. And of course, the mother's phenotype must be type uh, like A and the lowercase i. Uh, because in order for that type B to be expressed, not AB, right, we must send the non-expressing allele to the offspring. Does that make sense? The logic there? Okay, any questions? Good, okay, all right. Question three, we're talking about radishes this time. In radishes, color and shape are each controlled by a single locus with two incompletely dominant alleles. Color may be red, purple, or white. You can see the genotypes there. And shape can be long, oval, or round. You can see the genotypes there. What phenotypic classes and proportions would you expect among the offspring of a cross 
between two plants, heterozygous at both loci. I really encourage you to try to write this down. You cannot logic this in your own head. If you can, your working memory capacity is ridiculous. Go ahead. Three, four, five, six, seven, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. Good. Right. All right. Uh, I've got the solution up on the board here. Um, basically, you can just compare this with what you've got. I drew a branched line diagram to do this. This is the most effective way of doing it. There is, I would say a Punnett square is essentially impossible to do this with, okay? The basic idea is we assess one gene at a time, okay? Uh, that's always how you do this. You use Mendel's law of independent assortment, right? Uh, and this multiplicative rule, right? So what I do here is I first look at color, okay? And I say, because this is incomplete dominance, right, I get a ratio of 1 to 2 to 1. Classic, right? 
So you can see that I've just drawn that here. One out of four, one half, and one out of four again, right? One to two to one. Great. So the colors I would then have would be red, purple, and white, okay? Then, with those associated probabilities, I can multiply them by the probabilities of getting long, oval, or round, which again are also one to two to one. So what I would do here is I would multiply one quarter by one quarter, right? So then I get one sixteenth red long. I take one quarter multiplied by one half, right, the one to two to one, and I get one eighth red oval. Again, one quarter multiplied by, or sorry, one quarter multiplied by another quarter, right? The quarter that this is red, and then the quarter that I get uh, my homozy uh, homozygous recessive, right? So one quarter multiplied by a quarter, that's one sixteenth red round. And then I do the same for the half here. So realize that these are different prob probabilities, so I have to compute these. So one half multiplied by, again, one quarter is an eighth. Uh, that's, that, that's right here. So purple long. Then one quarter here, because I'm taking a half and multiplying it by um, a half, right? So I get a quarter. That's here, purple oval. And then one eighth purple round. What I can do then is because I know that this is also a quarter here, these are the same probabilities, right? And I'm working with the same probabilities for it being long, oval, or round in each situation. I can just take the ratios that I used for the first, the first set and just apply them to the last set right here. Just change the color, that's all, to white instead of red. And there you have it. Does that make sense? That's how I use a branch line diagram to solve one of these more complex problems. We good with that? Okay. We are on to the final question. This just says branch line diagram, so what I just did. Final question, then we can all go home. You do a cross between two true breeding strains of a zucchini. One has green fruit and the other has yellow fruit. The F1 plants are all green, but when these are crossed, the F2 plants consist of nine to seven, or nine to seven green and yellow. Explain this result. What mechanism is happening here? What were the genotypes of the two parental strains? Indicate the phenotypes with frequencies of the progeny of a test cross of the F1 plants. Go ahead. Am I going to erase this?
Do we still need a little bit more time? Are we more time? Are you good? Anyone else need more time? Okay. Let's get to this solution then. All right. So the first thing that we notice is we see a nine to seven ratio in the F2 generation. Okay. What should we automatically think when we see nine to seven? Someone just put their hand up. Yes. Dominant epistasis. No, that would be a 12 to 3 to 1 ratio. Other thoughts? Yes? No, that would be a 9 to 3 to 4 ratio. Yes? Yes. Complementation of two genes. 9 to 7 ratio. Classic. Okay. So since we know that there's complementation, we can use this to logic back. Okay? So if I know my F2... My F2 is 9 to 7, okay? And I know that my F1 is all the same, then I have to think about my parental generation, okay? So um, we'll, we'll just say like 9 to 7 here, expressing to non-expressing, okay? Um, let's think about this then. In order for F1 to truly be um, all green, so we're going to think of green, right? Because we see 9 to 7, green has to indicate the, like, the expressive phenotype, the, the, like, the dominant one, right? Because in complementation, it's the dominant phenotype, or the, the, dominant, the two dominant genotypes coming together that make for the expression, right? So if you're recessive, uh, if you're homozygous recessive, at either of the two genes, or at both of them, you get no expression. So you're going to get yellow, right? But for green, we can say, okay, it's some sort of dominant expression at both of those genes. So um, what we got to think about here is how this would then work. Let's posit a theory, okay? Let's say, let, let, me, let me use some, like I'm going to have to assign characters to this, right? So I'm going to say, um, let's just say A, A, and B, B, okay? Very simple, because we're working with two genes, okay? This is going to be the dominant, this is going to be recessive, dominant, recessive, okay? Let's say F1 is just that, A, A, B, B, okay? This would express all green because we have dominant, dominant, right? Phenotype, okay? And if I went to the parental generation, how would I produce this? Two pure breeding strains, right? One that would be A, A, uh, A, A, B, B and one that would be A, A, B, B. You can see how this would result in a yellow, right? Because neither of the two genes are expressing the dominant phenotype. So of course, this would fall into the category of that non-complementation, right? That seven kind of part. And then this would have uh, complementation, right? Because we have two genes working together to produce the trait. They're both dominant, okay? Then, of course, when I cross them, there's no mystery. There's no like ratio to consider here. All of the offspring are going to be this genotype, right? You can't escape that. Great. So this explains like green, yellow, green. That makes sense, right? And then, of course, the classic 9 to 7 ratio is the result of a dihybrid cross. Like, we think of 9 to 7 ratio, but what if I took like A, A, B, B, and with another A, A, B, B? I would get a different ratio, right? The 9 to 7 ratio and any of these ratios that we consider, 12 to 3 to 1, um, 9 to 3 to 4, all of those are dihybrid crosses. All of those are these genotypes right here. So that's kind of why we had to posit this, because for us to get the 9 to 7 ratio, we have to have a dihybrid. hybrid And so then, of course, that justifies why we can get a 9 to 7. So let me go to my official solution, OK? Uh, the parents are AA capitals, BB capitals, right? And parent 2 are all recessive. Um, and then if we did a test cross, right? A test cross, remember, is always recessive at both genes or any genes that we're looking at, right? And then we 
cross that with the F1, and we established that the F1 is this genotype, right? And so then, again, we think about this. Um, one quarter of the time, we're going to get both, both genes being a dominant phenotype. So think about it like this. What's the probability that I get the genotype A, uppercase A, lowercase? What's the probability that I get that in the offspring? One half, right? Very simple to think about. Okay, great. What's the probability that I get B, uppercase, lowercase? Also one half. Multiply that together, I get one quarter. Very simple, right? Anything else that is not a dominant phenotype at both genes is just going to be like yellow. It's going to be the non-expressed phenotype, right? So that's why I can say one quarter, and then the rest of this is going to be three quarters. So that is what we would see from a test cross. Does that make sense? You good with that? Okay, cool. Guys, thank you all for attending. Man, that was, thank you all. Yeah, this is really good. It's so cool to have these. It's almost a cultural experience, I would say. Look forward to the next one. I wish you all the best. Thanks for coming out. Don't forget to vote. Vote.wusa.ca.